what made the transition for Super Casanova then being on DNA if DNA was essentially a city beat? Why did they why did that change? Okay, so from what I understand, City Beat was a um, with City Beat DNA had a partner. He had a solid partner. I don't know who it was. You know, he never said who it was. Um, and then from City Beat, we got signed to Polygram first. So City Beat and then Polygram picked up the Do the James single. And um, that's how that transitioned. So I don't know who his partner was, but that's why it was called City Beat. And then later, um, of course, you know, later it was DNA International Records. And of course, you know, it, it became DNA because now there was no partner involved. So if that makes sense, <laughs> um, that's how, that's how it, it came about. Um, and then, and then there was also some talk about Chrysalis at the time. So there was, there was a toss up between Chrysalis and uh, Electra. Okay. Yeah. Now the interesting thing about this 87, 88 era is we're going from prior to that, really a lot of singles coming out before deals. And you guys were, I'd say around the last wave of that before people really, because 88, we have the explosion, including with you guys of albums coming out, just album, 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 instead of the first 10 years of rap being on record, it was all about singles leading up to albums later. So mm -hmm. since you guys were in that kind of last wave of that, did you, uh, like, did it seem like a long time in between or was it going so fast putting out the singles and the songs to get to the album? How did that feel to you? It didn't feel like there was too much of a break. It seemed like there was, we were, once the first single came out, we were just moving and we stayed working, you know, we stayed working all the time. So it, to us, it didn't seem like there was a big gap or a long process. It was one thing after another. And, um, you know, I think we were fortunate that we had those opportunities. Okay. And then on Super Casanova, you're talking lyrically about being like charming and dashing, but you're also, of course, bragging about lyrics and your microphone skills and all this different stuff. So uh, because a little bit later, a little right after this is when people, I think, started getting dissed or clown for wearing suits like you guys did or doing these different things. So why do you think that didn't affect you guys in a negative sense since that was part of your really, your look, your aesthetic, your thing? Um, I believe <clears throat> later on it did. Um, we even wanted to change our style later on, you know? And, um, you know, also we, you know, we went, we were, you know, named the Romeos of rap. You know, so we had to uphold this this Romeo image, this this pretty boy look, um, and we did for a while. But then we had, you know, you know, we we were dressed regular hip hop, you know. But when you're in front of the cameras, it was something totally different. Um, I remember uh, our Sony situation. You know, of course, you know when you have. Uh, when you have individuals who are actually putting up the money for you, they kind of get to say what they want you to look like, right? <laughs> or their idea of what, what they think it should be. Um, so there was, there, was a, there was a time when we actually had on ties on that Romeo single, you know? Um, ties and, and, and shirts, and that's not where we really wanted to go, you know? Same situation with, uh, with Wild Pitch. You know, they had, a, they had this look for us. And that's not where we wanted to go, but that's what they had in that's what they had in mind um, as far as sales. So it's something to learn from, you know, learn from that. Um, to, to be honest with you, yes, I've heard some things about, you know, we weren't hip hop, you know, <laughs> we didn't have, you know, because they now if you talk about hip hop, hip hop is a culture, and, and it was about the, the 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 clothes you wore, you know, how you walk, how you stand, how you you know, everything. So it was one big, you know, package being hip hop. And um, when I listened to some of those things, like, oh, we weren't exactly all of that. So does that mean we're not hip hop? No, not, not exactly. No, we were truly hip hop. We were like the epitome of hip hop. Well, like I said, girls got them locked. You got uh, e boying in the video. It's That's about as hip hop as it gets. Um, right. But also, um, before we get to that, the Super Casanova, I really liked 
how you had like the beat stop and a pausing toward the end of the song. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know like, as somebody, and also get some clarification. So some of the records, especially earlier on, it was you and Rudd were producing them all. And then I guess mm -hmm. Paul C was helping or how did you guys work as a production team really? So how it really worked was, you know, Paul was a great engineer. Paul taught us a lot. So, you know, when we finally, you know, when we met Paul, we brought our ideas to him. He thought they were great ideas. I thought Paul was amazing too for what he did. You know, a lot of things that, you know, he, he would, that SP 1200, you know, he's tapping this thing like it's nothing. I'm like, you know, amazing work. Um, which again, prompted us to go out and get one ourselves. You know, we ended up getting an SP 1200 and working on our tracks. Um, but, but as far as the production and how it went, myself and Rudd, we both produced most of the music and I can name what Paul produced. And that's what, that was pretty much Romeo and, um, I got, I got a good thing. Got a good thing. And I got a good thing. Yeah. So those were his exclusive productions. Um, the other ones he pretty much engineered and we all collaborated on ideas on what was best. And, you know, maybe we should drop the beat here, you know, things like that in the studio, drop it here. Let's try that. You know? So, um, you know, I've heard things like, well, if that's the case, then maybe he produced it. Well, no, <laughs> you know, we, we, collab <laughs> we collaborated on ideas, but as far as the tracks, the samples, everything that were that were in these songs we brought to the table um we also and, and we thought paul was amazing but paul also thought we were and we yeah and we were we were going to uh start a company called cpr which would have been a production company wow yeah that's impressive yep now with the reason I was asking about the production side of things, because on Super Casanova, toward the end of the song, you have the, the beat stop and it pauses and different things. So was that on the production side and even on rapping side, since that's really like your second song, I guess, at least released wise, was that already, you already were making all those steps to get that much more comfortable, that much more familiar where you're not just straight looping stuff and doing all these different things? Well, it kind of worked. Um... I mean, if, even if you listen to Duda James, we had some breaks in there. Um, but we also know that, you know, when we when we added those breaks, because I've rapped so fast, and I think this is what it was, a um, couple of secrets, you know, Paul sped it up a little bit, all right? <laughs> so after we finished the track, then, you know, which was done on, on two inch, sped it up a little bit, just a little bit, you know what I mean? To give it that much more of an effect. Um, but because that happened, that's why we had a lot of breaks to drive the point. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, so we did that. I think we did that in every song. We pretty much did that in every song because it worked. Also, you know, I, I mean, 20 years later, I had people say to me, you know, Soup, I never know what you were talking about. It was dope, but I don't know what you were talking about until now. You know, so it's always like, good to hear that like people say <laughs> i don't know why dna used to say just make it short sweet with a funky beat i don't know what you're talking about but do what you do and it worked well i was going to ask you about it later but since you brought it up i did notice with your you you were probably one of the few people who had very short verses relative to what was going on at the time so was that strictly a dna call or did you write that way naturally like yeah i wrote yeah, I wrote that way naturally. DNA didn't have, um, DNA was not part of the, the creative process at all. Um, but he used to always say that, you know, because DNA, you know, remember, was, was a radio personality. So he said, just make it short, sweet, with a funky beat, you know, so we can play it. Um, and just to add with DNA, you know, I, I never really say this much, but it was a, it was a strategic move with DNA. It wasn't like I wanted to, that was the first opportunity that I jumped on. Um, we shot a lot of our music. Um, with DNA, it made sense. If we go with this deal, guess what we have? Automatic airplay, because he has a show. So we thought about that. And um, that's why I wanted to go with DNA, because we knew that we were going to get airplay. And we knew how, how hard it was at the time, you know? 
get that radio airplay. Still is. Yeah. Um, now, now with with the DNA deal, did you guys have any input, or was it all on him as far as teaming with Electra? Because at the time, Electra, they had had the Fearless Four and Donald D. You know, back in the day, and of course, they're one of the biggest labels in music, in R and B and rock. But they hadn't really done much rap in the '87, '88 era that had been successful. So, what what made that a good business thing for you guys? Um, that was something that DNA worked out. I, I couldn't tell you all the particulars on how it worked, um, but you know, DNA had his connections. Who gave him a connection and Next thing you know, it's okay. You know, we'll listen to the guys and thought we were great. And, and, and we already had a track record. I mean, it, it shouldn't have been too hard. He had a track record. After do the James Super Casanova, um, there you go. Right. So when, yeah. when Girls I Got Em Locked, the song and the video come out and everything, and then the album starts kicking in, what difference did you notice from just putting out singles to now you have, like, the, the push? Like, how... How does that change everything? Um, well, it changes it more on a national level. You know what I mean? So we started doing more tours outside of the local area. You know, because I remember when uh, Duda James was out and, and, and it was local, you know, we did a lot of high schools, you know, college, local clubs, <coughs> excuse me, local clubs and all. But then once, you know, once, uh, these guys pushed it and DNA had a little team that he worked with who made a lot of phone calls and things like that. And next thing you know, we were traveling outside of our local area and doing a lot of shows. So definitely when you, when you get to a, a major, you know, it's that, that dis distribution and, and then a little bit more marketing. So. Okay. Yeah. And then on the, the album itself, you remember how or why you guys picked girls. I got a lot for the title. Uh, because we were the Romeo's a rap. I mean, it was just, it was a, it was a no brainer. Okay. <laughs> because uh, when I got the album itself, I just remember on back is so much like louder and harder and aggressive compared mm -hmm. to a lot of the other stuff. Mm -hmm. So why did you guys decide for the album's sake to put that song first? Okay. So um, I don't know strategically why it was done. Um, but it's, I, I think we talked about it a little bit. And what it was is we've been gone for a while. You know, we did, we did the, the first three singles. All right. Then we dropped for a little bit and we had to work on this album now. You know, and now we get this album deal. And there you go. I'm back. I was gone for a minute, worked on my album, and I'm back, you know. Um, and just to talk about uh, the production you know, we also have, and no one ever talks about this, we always bring up um, Paul C., but Rod Way from Green Street Studios did five of those songs. So we always talk about, you know, Paul C. And, and, and the production piece of it, but we never mentioned Rod Way. But Paul didn't produce, uh, or engineer, I should say, didn't engineer all of the songs. Right. You know, so he, he did five, and the other five were done by Rod Way. Also, uh, that's interesting because on, uh, on I'm Back, also, that's one of the few instances or with you cussing on it. So yeah. what, what made you want to cuss on that and not cuss elsewhere? Oh, where did I cuss on that? When you said who gives a shit or something? Oh, well, yeah. So, yeah, who gives a shit what you believe in, right? So, yeah, just all the, just all the chatter and the talk on the streets, you know, you know, when you're hot people are going to have something to say, you know what I mean? And, and one of the things was um, the fact that, again, we will, you guys are going to be one hit wonders. You're not going to be around for a while. You know what I mean? So then I'm back, you know, came from that. And then, yeah, gives a shit what you believe in. <laughs>
Be sure to check out the History of Gangster Rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangster Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangster Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always gonna be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.